everybody, and welcome to episode 76 of Books Cubed, the show where I chat with authors you should be reading. It is Thursday, September 10th, 2020, and I have another great show for you this week. I am chatting with horror writer Carter Wilson. It's a great interview. I loved his latest book, The Dead Girl in 2A. We're going to get right to it, and I will see you after. So I want to welcome Carter Wilson to the show this week. I'm really excited to be chatting with him. I really loved his book. I'm going to start out by reading his bio. Uh, hang on here. Okay. Carter Wilson is the USA Today and number one Denver Post bestselling author of six critically acclaimed standalone psychological thrillers, as well as numerous short stories. He is an ITW Thriller Award finalist, a four-time winner of the Colorado Book Award, and his novels have received multiple starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Library Journal. His latest novel, The Dead Girl in 2A, was released in July 2019 from Poison Pen Press. He lives in Erie, Colorado, in a Victorian house that is spooky but isn't haunted yet, and we'll get back to that. And let's see. So I want to read just a real quick... Um, I, I found Carter, somebody, I don't know who, somebody recommended your mailing list, your newsletter. Oh, yeah. And his great. newsletter is awesome. And so I think I, I probably listened to, a read uh, three or four newsletters, and I kept seeing the little thing about that dead girl in 2A at the very top. And, um, and then finally, oh, I got to check that book out. And oh, I, I got the audio book, which I really, really, I thought the guy did, the, the woman and the man did a great job. So let me read uh, the description here from The Dead Girl in 2A, which was a winner of the 2020 Colorado Book Award and a finalist for the MPIBA Reading the West Award. Okay. Uh, this flight will take them somewhere they never expected to go. Jake Buchanan knows the woman sitting next to him on his business flight to Denver. He just can't figure out how he knows her. Clara Stowe isn't in Jake's line of work and didn't go to college with him. They have nearly nothing in common apart from a deep and shared certainty that they've met before. As their airplane conversation deepens, both struggle to find out what circumstances could have possibly brought them together. Then, in a revelation that sends Jake reeling, Claire admits she's traveling to the Colorado Mountains to kill herself, and she disappears into the crowded airport immediately after landing. Dun, dun, dun. And that gives me chills oh, every good. time. <laughs> Every time I read it, I love it. So you, um, I know you're 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 a member of Mr. Writers uh, of America because you were in a collection with um, a bunch of other mystery writers. Yeah, there was a. First of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. Most I appreciate it. Sure. Um, yeah, I was in an R.L. Stein um, anthology where we were asked to write horror stories from a YA perspective. So I, I took a shot at that and it got selected for, for that book. So that was pretty exciting. That's exciting. Yeah, so that they were horror. I mean, I figure with R.L. Stein, it had to have been horror, but uh, with, it kind of threw me because it's from Mystery Writers of America. So horror writers are also in Mystery Writers? Yeah, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of crossover. And so R.L. Stein himself, for example, um, is very actively involved in MWA and ITW, which is the International Thriller Writers. So everyone's kind of part of everything. Um, I mean, you know, if you look at Stein's work, it's not, it's horror, but for kids. So it's, you know, you couldn't compare it to some of the really gritty horror stuff out there. Um, so this was pretty light horror. Uh, it was kind of spooky, Halloween-y kind of, kind of uh, injuries that they were looking for. So that was a good challenge for me. And my daughter at the time was, probably 12 or 13. So I gave my story to her to edit and she's the only one who saw it before I submitted it. And she had some really good feedback and, uh, and yeah, it, it made the cut. So that was pretty cool. Very good idea. So do you prefer, yeah, I see most of your stuff is um, horror, but it's very suspenseful. You have six full novels out, right? Yeah, I have six standalone novels out and I kind of, you know, I, I probably technically labeled a thriller writer um but it's definitely on the dark side of things dark psychological suspense is really interesting to me um i've probably gravitated a little bit like my first couple books were just really dark <laughs> and and i i don't know if i've intentionally softened them up but i've i've kind of gotten away from certainly some more of the violent aspects of the book there's usually violence in all my books but it's 
it usually is very infrequent. Um, so when it happens, it's very impactful. Um, and it's not so, my first published book was a serial killer book, but since then it hasn't been so much, you know, here's a serial killer book. It's more like, hey, here's a person who I think is interesting and all this shit is happening to them and what are they going to do? And usually what happens to them is out of the ordinary. It's, you know, something that is not just typically, it's usually a very involved plot. Um, so that just, that just interests me to see what they're going to do because I like to think like, well, what would I do in this situation? Um, and that's, and that, that goes to say that I don't outline. So I don't, when I really don't know what they're going to do, I really don't know what they do. I just throw stuff at them and I'm just like, okay, let's see what happens. And it might be interesting and it might not be, but I don't outline. So I just, it's fun for me to kind of follow that, that journey as well. Oh yeah, definitely. And I, I like that, you know, talking about kind of the everyman aspect of throw them in the situation of what would they do? And I, I felt that very much with the girl in 2A, dead girl in 2A. You know, Jake just was just this nice guy. He had these issues. He had a daughter who'd had a car accident and, and who'd been in the car with him when he had an accident. So he's got these issues he's dealing with, but he felt very much like any guy. And the fact that all of a sudden he's thrown into this thing and he's got to find this girl because he doesn't want her to kill herself. I thought was great. And, you know, in, in, when you talked in the last news, uh, it might have been the last newsletter or maybe two times ago, you talked about violence for the sake of violence. You know, do you, do you, it's not necessary. Right. Uh, and I feel the same way about sex. <laughs> you know, like I don't, I write very few sex scenes, almost, you know, you could probably, probably maybe three out of my six books because, you know, does, and, and that goes for anything you're writing, does what, you're doing in this moment serve the story and certainly i've cut stuff out and i'll sometimes i'll write an over the top violent scene because i'm in that moment and then i go back and read my all right that's way too much it doesn't need to be that um so a lot of it's a lot of it for sure is in the editing um but yeah you're right i'm very focused on the kind of the everyday person and really how i write is i start with just an opening scene and that scene is apropos of nothing, right? So it's just, I'll think of the scene that if I were watching a TV show or reading it in a book and that was the opening scene, I would want to know more. So I wrote the Dead Girl in 2A, the opening scene where they're on the plane and the idea that they're just, they viscerally know each other somehow. Um, and, and I didn't know anything about what their background was. And I wrote the scene and then I felt like there was something missing. And then I went back and added the fact that Clara was going to kill herself because that added this whole element of this relationship that's not even a relationship, but there's this responsibility now. It's like, do I just, you know, I'm not her hero. That's not my role, but I'm here to, but can I just, knowing that I'm connected to her, be okay that she's just leaving my life now. So then I spent the rest of the book trying to figure out what that opening scene meant. Um, and that's typically how I write. And with Dead Girl in 2A in particular, it got very hairy about halfway through where, it got so complex that I had to take a month off and just think about it um, because it was getting too far in the weeds. So that's probably one of the most difficult books I've ever written just because trying to, trying to solve for how all, this, all the, these people knew each other um, and make it not too far-fetched became, <laughs> became a creative challenge. Yeah, well, you know, it has a very, it had a very satisfying ending. And as I was listening to it, I listened to the audiobook when I would go on yeah. walks. My husband has been reading Harry Potter or listening to Harry Potter books because he never saw them or read them or anything. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm like, you really, you know, you really need to listen to those. And so he would listen to those and I would listen to The Dead Girl. And I, I kept telling my husband, if the ending does not satisfy, I will be so disappointed. But and yeah. I was not disappointed. It, it really... I, it ended and I, I sat in my kitchen thinking, yeah, I mean, that, that totally, totally worked. It, I didn't feel that, that there was anything missing or it was contrived or anything like that. Well, that's good. I mean, endings, you know, very difficult. And, and you, think about, you think about your readers a lot and you know, boy, I know a lot of people aren't going to be happy with this ending, no matter what the story is that you're writing. Um, and most of the time, I don't know what the ending is myself and tell them about maybe three quarters of the way done with the book, I'll kind of think of the ending. And really the only way that I can, feel, you know, I have to feel satisfied by the ending. I have to write the ending and I have to feel, 
you know, kind of emotional about it. Um, and then I know that, you know, it made me happy. Um, yeah, and then you get feedback from your agent, from, you know, you go through multiple rounds of edits with the publisher and stuff like that. But rarely do I, it's funny, the book coming out next year, The Dead Husband is, you know, the ending was a little bit longer than I had it. And then the publisher's like, I feel like the emotional end of the book is right here. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, you kind of just sit on that information and, you know, they don't force you to change it, but you just like really think about that and try to take yourself out. You're like, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, so it is, it is really interesting to get feedback about the ending, but it is hard to, you're never going to make everybody happy. That's for sure. No, you're not. And you know, with readers have such expectations for the genre they read in, they have to have, they want those certain, there's certain things to happen. So as you're writing, you know what the expectations are. Do you feel, is it, is it, is it tough to try to follow those or do you feel like you want to step away from what is expected and kind of be a little different, kind of throw them for a loop? Yeah, definitely the latter. And that's why I think it's hard to kind of label my genre for a lot of people because first of all, my books are standalone. And the reason, one of the reasons I've never written a series is I've never been so engaged with a character that I want to see them keep going. I mean, I have kind of, but I also want to be able to kill anybody at any time. And I have done that before too, where it's just like, it'll just hit me like this person dies in the scene. What would that look like? How cool would that be? And then maybe it's a mistake and maybe I go back and rewrite it. Um, but I want to be able to do that. Um, and what makes me the most, most satisfied in getting comments from readers is this was totally not what I expected. Um, when, when I hear that and whether it's for the good or for the bad, you know, people see dead girl in 2A and it very much sounds like, oh, okay. A murder mystery there's a dead girl in apartment 2a and it's it's a it's a way bizarre story compared to that and so i got so many comments like i almost didn't pick this up because it just sounded like the typical mystery trope um so yeah i take great pride in in confounding expectations <laughs> and i don't do it purposefully again because i don't outline like i'm mostly writing to entertain myself i'm like oh this would be really interesting if this happened and what does that mean for the rest of the story um, and so, you know, a lot of times I have to cut that stuff out and I have to go back and rewrite to, you know, Dead Girl in 2A, you know, I had to be reeled in a lot by my editor because it was really out there before the final product came out. Um, so I grounded it. So you do rely on all that advice, but I don't ever get told like, you know, you've got to have, you know, at least four suspects and they all have to be like this. And, you know, so, you know, I, I kind of go off roading a little bit for sure. I'm glad you do because, um, yeah, it was out there, but it was reasonable out there. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm, I've always been, you know, there was a little bit about that book to me that was kind of an homage to the TV show Lost um, because I, I love that. I love the idea of kind of the metaphysical, but then where it's grounded in enough, you know, maybe faux science that you're like, okay, I'll buy that. Um, that's super interesting to me because then you can go on a, a really interesting journey. Um, if you, if you cross that boundary where it's becomes truly, you know, supernatural, um, that can be challenging. So anything that's supernatural in my books is usually all within the mind of somebody who is highly unreliable. Um, and so it's most likely their imagination, but, but that gives you the freedom to have some weird things happen to them as long as it's all contained within their own ecosystem. Do you think that um, <clears throat> writing weird and kind of offbeat things, do you think that you have to have, and do, do you consider yourself to be a little weird and offbeat? Um, yeah, for sure. But I think everybody is. Um, I think, I think, and I get the same question about like, you know, you write dark stuff and but you seem like a normal guy. And, you know, my contention is I think everybody has contains those elements and it's just to whatever degree you face society with them, that you're outward with them as opposed to, you know, like, you know, I, I can be a very romantic guy. I would never write a romance novel because I just don't think I would be good at it. Um, so, yeah, but it definitely helps to be a little weird, but it's more important to be creative, to think about, well, what, what would be a strange thing? The biggest thing to me when I write is I'm constantly asking what if, and, you know, halfway through a chapter, what if this happened? And what that what if is usually 
something kind of out there just to challenge myself to see like, you know, could this be a direction that people wouldn't be expecting? Um, and usually you can find some pretty interesting trails to go down if you constantly are asking yourself that when you're writing. So yeah, again, you, which if, if you outline that wouldn't work because then you're with your outline in seconds. I was just going to say, yeah, that sounds like then you'd have to really not be an outliner, but to sit down and kind of go, oh, well, just kind of write yourself in the corners and how do I get out of it? Yeah, you kind of hope that your subconscious is working in the background and that, you know, because I'll, I'll be two thirds of the way through a book and then I'll, it'll just dawn on me, I'm like, oh, this book is about this. And there's just some theme that comes to mind that I'm like, I didn't realize I was writing about people who are addicted to saving other people, but that's totally what this book is. Um, you know, it, in the case of Dead Girl in 2A, I knew on the outset, you know, without the outline and only with the idea for the opening scene, I knew I wanted to write about the Colorado mountains and I knew I wanted to write about memory. Those were the two that my story is going to deeply involve both of these things and I have no idea how, but that was, that was interesting to me. So you just hope that your subconscious is kind of somewhere weaving all that together and it might take a while. That's why I don't write a book at every, you know, 90 days it yeah. takes me a year. I was just going to say, yeah. Do you find that you have to, um, uh, are you a runner or do you, uh, do you do anything that helps you let your mind just kind of veg and kind of work the story? Yeah. Well, I, I don't actually think about my stories until I sit down to write. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very active um, and I have a full-time job as well in addition to this. So I only write around five o'clock every evening and I sit down for about an hour and you know, I sit down and it's the same setting almost all the time, the same sound in the background. And that's when my mind opens up. I'm like, okay, where, where was I? What's going on? I read the last few paragraphs. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. And then I just sit there for a few minutes and just think about the direction. Um, and then, you know, I try to, I try to knock out 500 words. And if I do 500 words a day, you know, I can do a, a full manuscript plus multiple rewrites, plus send it to my agent, get it back with her comments and have it ready to go to the publisher within a year. Um, so I just, you know, do that and try to target a book a year and just, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great escape for me every night. It's like I get to go into this world that nobody else knows about but me and, and, and rarely even me. So yeah, it's so, fun. So you had said before you write for yourself and you don't really worry about the readers. Now, what about the awards? I mean, you've won quite a few awards. Do you, and I don't want to put thoughts in your head, but do you worry as you're sitting down to write, will this one be good enough? compared to the last ones I wrote? I think about more, I mean, and, and, and that's not to be dismissal, dismissive of my audience because I do think about, you know, am I going too far out there? I think a lot about my agent, Pam, because I know her, I've been with her for, um, geez, 17 years. Um, and, I, and sometimes I'll be writing something, I'm like, oh, she's gonna hate this. And so I'll be aware because she was looking at things from a very like, you know, is, can this sell? Are your readers going to like this? Um, and I just had a discussion with her yesterday about something that I just finished. And, and there's some concerns in terms of, is this is getting a little bit too dark? Is this crossing the bat? And I'm like, yeah, I, I knew that going into it. Um, but yeah, in terms of award, it's funny, like you get all these hopes up for a book that's coming out and you just have no idea. I'm like, is this going to be something that the general public is going to love? Or is it just going to be like, you know, moderately received? How much, how much support is the publisher going to get put behind it or my own PR team put behind it? And you just don't know where it's going to lead to. So you just try to do the best you can and do something that makes you proud, you know, and then just kind of just let it go out there to the universe and and then just, you know, and by the time a book comes out, I've usually written a whole other book by then. So it's like, I'm almost, I'm like, oh yeah, that's coming out now. And what was that about? Yeah, you have to go back and reread it probably. <laughs> yeah. <it's a> <laughs> so are, are, all, are all of your books um, audio also? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I haven't heard the, I mean, I got, I got the books uh, on, they send you CDs, which I think I don't have a CD player. Um, so I, I've listened to like the sample snippet on Amazon, but that's the most I've ever heard it. So I didn't realize there were so many narrators. So that's, I'm glad they did a good job. That's, that's really cool. 
Yeah, they did. There's a narrator. There's actually, I think, three narrators in oh. Dead Girl. So, cool. um, yeah, it, yeah. I, I don't want. I don't want to say anything. So I don't want to give anything away. Um, I, I don't want. I don't want to screw that up. So, in your in your bio, you talk about the house you live in. It's not haunted yet. Do you have hopes? <laughs> <laughs> not hopes as much as plans. <laughs> Uh, I live in a neighborhood that they're all newer homes. I mean, 2000, but they're all, um, they're all Victorian homes. So I built mine or I had mine built um, and it, and kind of modeled after the haunted house at Disneyland. So it's uh, lots of bats outside and it's got turrets and it's green and purple and it's gargoyles. And yeah, we, we, I put on a good show every Halloween. I don't know about this year, but Jim, most Halloween we get, yeah, I, I was thinking of you the other day because I, I thought, oh, I can't wait to get your newsletter for October. And then I thought, wait a minute, it's COVID. You're not going to be able to have a haunted house. Yeah, I'm going to do something in the lawn. So something where like kids can come and there's not candy in a centralized bowl. I, may, I might just throw candy. Yeah, I have a big display and throw candy on the lawn and you can just go pick up a piece or, you know, I have to do something because it's, you know, yeah, the numbers yeah, are going to be way down. We we love haunted we love Halloween and we used to live in a in a neighborhood in Alabama and we had almost an acre and a huge front yard and I dug graves and I made all the tombstones and we had a tree right there and I had a white picket fence around the graveyard and Great. things coming out and and then I I put down I, I did um, made myself look like a skeleton and then I had a hoodie on so you couldn't see my skeleton face until you got close to me That's so. Awesome. I, this lady had come by with her little kid. She lived down the street from me. And the kid was really fascinated, a little scared. And then I find out, like a year later, my neighbor says, do you know the lady down the street has been telling her kid, if you don't eat your vegetables, I'm going to have the witch down the street come visit you. <laughs> uh, well, you were serving it as a good rule then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Gosh. So, so I imagine that that, that if you did a haunted house out or, out or a haunted yard, that might give you some ideas for a future book, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's funny how, like, you know, your ideas are just such transcendent things. Like, you're just, I, I don't sit there and think about what I'm going to write about next, but I might read an article one day and just be like, oh, my God, that's really bizarre. And what, what would happen if this? So that was the inspiration for Mr. Tender's Girl was about the slender man stabbings and i took that in an entirely different way and in fact i stopped reading any i read the initial article about it when it happened these stabbings and i didn't read anything else ever again about it because i wanted to write this story that was completely different but inspired by that so you never know what's going to spark you um and again with dead girl it was just like what would it be like if two people are on a plane and they were just convinced that they knew each other? What is that come? I wanted to see what that conversation looked like. Um, and I'm like, well, they have to really think that they knew each other for it to actually become a conversation. So, you know, it's just that little spark of an idea. And then all of a sudden I'm like, all right, I guess this is my book. Let's see where it's going to go. Um, how far, how so far did you get through the book before you knew what the ending was going to be? That was probably about halfway through after I took that month off. I literally cover my office walls, this office here, in those big sheets of 3M post-it paper and had all these different colored markers. And I would come into my office for about an hour a day and I would just write words in different colors on these sheets of paper covering two walls. And I would just stare at these words and just try, I mean, it was almost like, you know, an FBI, like you're trying to figure out how everything's connected. I'm like, well, how are these people connected? And sometimes if just a single word would be like, Oh, that's interesting. Maybe this person's more like this. Um, so I had a, probably a rough idea of, about the ending, and then it really firmed up about three quarters of the way through. Um, and then I still had to do, you know, probably five rewrites on it. So it was <laughs> it was a long slog. <clears throat> nice. I, I like that 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 I did the idea of the the writing. Although I I uh, my office is covered in whiteboards. And I oh. use, you know, the markers, all the different colored markers. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I have like 40 markers. And yeah, it's just covered everywhere with different colors. Um, I, I think it really helps to, to see it all in one place. It does. Yeah. And I'm a pretty visual person, but I had never done that before. And just the idea kind of came to me. And, and there wasn't a singular aha moment, but there was kind of like what you said, seeing everything together 
your brain kind of collects the pieces, I think, more effectively than scraps of different, you know, word documents. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was it was it was an interesting process to go through. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as a writer, every writer I talk to always has some bizarre purchase or, or something that they've done either to help them or to celebrate their writing. So have you got something that, that either, either was purchased because you wanted to write or because you were celebrating a book? Well, I did, I did, uh, you know, after my first book came out in 2012, I did go out and buy like a, a $200 ballpoint pen, which is such an extravagant, to me, that like, said like, this is what I'm going to use to sign my uh, thousands and thousands of, of copies of books. And, you know, and I knew that was delusional even at the time, but it was, it, it was nice. And then like, you actually start signing books, you're like, I really like Sharpies. <laughs> I would much rather sign in a Sharpie anytime. Um, uh, but I will tell you the, on a practical level, the best money I've ever spent writing, um, although it's hard to quantify is I, I hire my own PR team for every book launch who then works in conjunction with the publisher's PR marketing team. Um, because it's so terribly difficult to even just get your name out there. And so my publisher is Sourcebooks, who does uh, and Poison Pen Press, and they do a tremendous job uh, on the marketing and PR side, much more so than you'd find many other places. But still, I like to compliment that because, you know, the more exposure you can get, even, even if you're not necessarily selling all the books to pay for that, it's, it's creating brand awareness. And, and the business side of publishing is, is they're tricky waters to navigate and they're, they're very difficult to understand. Um, and a lot of writers, I think, you know, are just like, well, I, I did my job, I wrote the book. And the reality of it is, is there's a business element to it that even if you traditionally published, you still need to be highly aware of and, and you need to do things like podcasts and anything to get your name out and, and to, to help spread awareness. So, so yeah, I always spend a lot of money <laughs> on a PR firm. You know, I, I think it's smart. There's something like, what is it, seven or eight million books just on Amazon Amazon yeah. alone. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I forget what the, I have to look it up, but how many are published every day? It's crazy. It, it's a tremendous number. And and what I've learned through Goodreads and Instagram um, and is just the power of word of mouth is tremendous. And, and you're not going to get word of mouth if you're you know, if you're not putting any effort behind, you know, at least doing campaigns to get people excited about your book. Um, but then it can organically really grow from that. Um, but you have to have that certain level of aware, you know, uh, awareness about your books to even get to the point where word of mouth could even happen after that. So yeah, it's, it's a brutal industry. It's, there's no question about it. Oh, it is. It definitely is. So do yeah. you have, when you think about a place you want to go to immerse yourself in something. Do, do you want to go to places outside of just your office? I mean, is there some place in the world that you would like to go to kind of get a feel for, for something that you might be interested in writing about? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I usually, my locations are usually places I'm not very familiar with um, because that's just interesting to me because it's, then I get to kind of also learn about a new place. So a good example is with Mr. Tinder's Girl. I knew I wanted, it was gonna take place in October and I wanted it to be in New England because New England's a very October-y kind of a place. Um, and I wanted it to be in a city that was not tiny, but not like Boston. So I just randomly kind of chose, or not totally randomly, but I chose Manchester, New Hampshire, and I'd never been there. So I, I flew out there and spent like four days and I stayed at this lovely Airbnb and I just walked around all day and be like, okay, this is where she lives. And this is the coffee shop that she owns. And I'd go into that coffee shop and I'd write there. I'm like, yeah, this is the place. And it would, it would, it would inspire me. Um, the book coming out next year, it actually is the first time I've set a book entirely into a, a fictional town, um, called Bury, uh, New Hampshire. And, um, it's, it's like a small version of Manchester, small and affluent. Um, there, I didn't travel again, but I can, I can, I can very easily picture it. Uh, but that trip to Manchester was very informative for me, for sure. 
And that was for one of your earlier books, you said? Yeah, that was Mr. Tinder's Girl, um, which is probably my most well-known book. That came out right before Dead Girl on Tour. And then the next one, The Dead Husband, I've been re I didn't realize it's coming out next July. Next May, yeah. Next May. Yeah, yeah. Been, in, in your newsletter, in his newsletter, he knows, uh, he, put, he puts a little snippet from the book in the newsletter. And so I've been reading those little snippets in the, and oh. then like, like this morning, I'm like, I was getting notes ready for this afternoon and thought, oh, I'm going to buy your next book, which is The Dead Husband. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we just got the uh, advanced review copies in. Um, so several, several months ahead of time. Um, but that's always, so my next newsletter will be a little video of me opening up that box because that's always, you haven't, you know, you've seen everything, but you haven't physically seen them and then they just arrive and you're like, oh, it never oh, gets old. Yeah, I mean, you've got something that's been in your head and all of a sudden you're yeah. holding it in your hands. I mean, what was that like the first time, the first time that you got books oh, it's from crazy. your publisher? It's crazy. Like in my very first publisher was an extremely small uh, publisher, so they didn't even have advanced review copies. So I, I got the final version of the books and it's the first time I've seen it. It's just like, yeah, it's what's always weird to me. And this sounds very trite, but I'm always surprised about how short my chapters are when they're in a, when they're in proper book. Form. I write, I know I write very short chapters. That's very intentional. But in my manuscript, my, you know, when I submit a manuscript, it's probably 500 pages. And by the time it's formatted in a book, it's probably 400 pages. So some chapters are like a page and a half. I'm like, oh, damn, that's a short chapter. <laughs> and you don't realize it until you see it in the physical form. Um, but yeah, it's always, it's always crazy to see your books. Short, and, and short chapters are good, uh, especially before COVID. Uh, people didn't have a lot of time. You know, they're, they're in, in, on trains or they're in a coffee shop or they're in a car or they're in line at the doctor's office and they want to read short chapters. So it's actually good right. that you write that way. Yeah. And it wasn't intent. You know, a lot of times I'll be writing a chapter and I'll just be like, okay, end it here. Just that's a cool line and end it here. Even though if it might continue that same scene in the next chapter, um, that just is interesting to me to do that. But the number of times I've had people tell me, you know, I'm in bed reading your book. It's late. And I'm like, okay, this chapter's only got two pages left. Great. And then there's a cliffhanger, even though it might not be like a major, it's just a sentence that's enticing. Okay, well, oh, the next chapter is only five pages, so I'll read that. And then they're like, next thing I know, it's three in the morning, I finished the book. <laughs> I'm like, that's great. It, it really does create uh, pace to do that, for sure. Yeah, it, I mean, it's hard. And, and yeah, it, it's hard to, to put it down. And yeah, you're right. You'll, you'll, you'll open the book and it's like a page and a half. I'm going to read this and then you get to that line. And a lot of the lines in The Dead Girl, a lot of the end of the chapters were, uh, okay, I'd tell my husband, don't talk to me yet. I got to listen a little bit more. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked really well. Yeah. Oh, geez. I just forgot what I was going to ask you. Oh, I know what it was. Okay. So um, the new one's coming out in May, The Dead Husband. Yes. Are you working on something right now? Yeah. So I actually just finished another book that um, takes place in the same fictional town as The Dead Husband. Um, and I'm about 25,000 words into something new that I told my agent she's probably not going to like it. Because <laughs> it's, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's, it, I've had this idea about this person in my head for several months and so I'm writing about this um, girl an 18 year old girl and it's and it's not necessarily a thriller I don't know what it is yet it's just and it's, it's, it takes place in the 80s and it's it's just totally different but I just I'm like I want to see what happens um, so I, I I'm kind of following her story a little bit and just you know seeing where she goes to and it's and it might turn into a thriller it might turn into horror uh, but yeah, so right now it's just, it's just something that I want to write. So that's, that's the definition of being kind of vain a little bit is right when it comes to writing for yourself. And it's like, it might not ever go anywhere. Nobody ever might want it and I'll just have it. But I'm like, I just want to see what happens. So hopefully I won't spend too much time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you tend to just write one at a time? I mean, do you wait till you're done with a book and then start the next? Or do you have a bunch of half started half half finished drafts 
or have finished novels uh, and then find yourself I, moving on to something different if it doesn't pan out? Yeah, no, I, I can't let something go. So, and I'm very singular focused. So I will, write, you know, once I'm writing something, I'm writing that. And that's, I'm, there's not going to be halfway through and I give up. I, I mean, it could happen. It hasn't happened yet. You know, I had one story, my first three manuscripts never sold. Um, I got an agent with my first manuscript, but my first three never sold. And the second or the third book that I wrote that I gave to my agent, <laughs> she called me and she's like, this is never going to sell anywhere. <laughs> she's like, this is way too like messed up and dark. And so I spent a year rewriting that book because I couldn't let it go. And then it still didn't sell. So do you yeah. think about self-publishing? Indie publishing, I shouldn't call it self. I used to be a literary agent and the term self-publishing yeah. <laughs> means that if somebody has 10,000 copies of their one, own, one and only book in their garage. So do you ever think about indie publishing any of those books that didn't sell? Because they, um, they, they will always say, there'll be, always be a company that'll say, this will never sell. And then the girls, the ladies I had on last week, um, two weeks ago, she writes horse equine yet young adult and she couldn't get an agent yet she sold i forget how many it was like fifty thousand copies on her own <laughs> well that's tremendous and that's probably more the exception and and i'm certainly not against indie publishing i mean i i there's a reason those first three books didn't sell right and i go back and look at them or i don't actually because i'm kind of embarrassed by them but you know, I treat them as, okay, those were my training wheels. Those are, that was me learning how to write. Cause I had never written before, you know, I, I started writing just very serendipitously um, in my early thirties. And, you know, but if, you know, now that I have more of an audience, that's not to say that if a publisher didn't want something of mine for, for some, you know, marketing reason or, or, you know, any reason aside from just them not liking the book, then I would be, I'd be, I wouldn't want to just necessarily let it go if I thought, you know, hey, I could put this up and I've got a following that I think I could sell some of these. Um, but it, when I first started the whole publishing journey, it was very important to me to be traditionally published. I needed that validation because I had no idea if I was any good or not. So I needed that outside validation. And I know a number of people who have, have gone the indie publishing route and, you know, and again, I'm not against it, but sometimes if you race to that end, you're putting out stuff that's not ready to be put out yet. Um, and it's out there and, you know, it's forever out there. So, you know, I, I needed those three books to learn the basics of how to write a story. Um, and, you know, every book, I feel like I learn more and more. So, um, so yeah, it's a difficult decision to make for sure. Definitely. Well, well, I'm glad that you, you uh, did not give up because we wouldn't have the dead girl in 2A, <laughs> um, which is really good. And um, I want to thank you for coming on today. And really quickly, can you tell everybody how they can find you? And I'm going to put a link to Carter's uh, newsletter in the show notes because you will want to join his newsletter because it is really good. <laughs> Well, I appreciate the shout out. I actually spend, I only put my newsletter out once a month and I spend several, several, several hours working on each one because I want to make it good. So I appreciate you, 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 you plug in it for me, but yeah, you can just find out anything you want to know about uh, my books at carterwilson.com. And uh, I certainly appreciate you having me on your podcast, Melissa. Oh, I'm so happy you could come. I could speak. I'm so happy you could come on today. <laughs> awesome. Oh, well, enjoy okay. your uh, enjoy your long weekend. <laughs> Thanks, you too. All you right. Find out everything you need to know about Carter down in the show notes. I will have a link to his website, and he said there's pop ups and spots on all the pages to join his newsletter, and I highly recommend that you join his newsletter. It is really good, really good. I look forward to it every month. And that's it for this time. If you have a book that I desperately need to read, please drop down to the show notes and click on comment here. It will take you over to our YouTube page where you can comment, tell me all about whatever you're reading or whatever you're writing that I need to read. And over on that page, they're all together because the show is all kinds of places. So this way I see the comments and um, I can comment or uh, find good books to read from them. So that's it. Like I said, I will be back next time with another great show. 
And in the meantime, go read a good book. Mm-hmm.